All right. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, uh, Joel. And uh, let's get started with this uh, talk. So you see the title. That's what I'm trying to do. That's how I feel. Uh, how many of you know what this picture is about, or where this picture was taken? Uh, raise hands. Yeah, it's a right like my generation. Uh, it's a Commodore 64 game, uh, Impossible Mission. It's really epic. Anyways, uh, so the real title is uh, Theory of Reinforcement Learning. And then the reason I was uh, saying it's Mission Impossible because in, in an hour and a half, and or uh, right now an hour and 20 minutes uh, doing all this, I feel that uh, I'm trying to achieve something uh, really great. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, so at any time during the talk, if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. And also, you have to speak uh, loudly when you're asking a question, because uh, these chairs are you know, like musical chairs. Uh, <laughs> and I'm part deaf, so take those into account. And then you have to shout at me, OK? Uh, I will try my best. But uh, So here's the contents. Uh, so how many people here in this room have ever you know, uh, touched theory? Uh, in machine learning, yeah, those are my folks. So how many people haven't done that? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's fine. You are my people, too, uh, or after this talk. Uh, so first, uh, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on motivating uh, why we should be talking about theory, why we should care about theory. Uh, and what theory can uh, bring to the table. And uh, then we jump in the middle. I'm going to talk about various aspects of theory of reinforcement learning, uh, including batch learning, uh, using simulators, uh, these planning algorithms. And if you don't have simulators, what can you do and what you should be looking at. Um, and. Uh, like, I really feel that I need to manage expectations here. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that I'm not going to cover. I'm unable to cover, uh, given the limited time that I have. Uh, so we will only cover very, very simple things. But don't think that only those exist over there. There are other things that exist over there. I'll be around uh, for the rest of the day and tomorrow. And so if you have any questions, uh, in connection to this talk or anything else, please come and, and talk to me. So I'm going to talk about very simple tasks. And I'm going to try to illustrate principles uh, that we use in theory and uh, some, some hurdles that, that you need to overcome. Uh, I want to highlight those hurdles uh, that make reinforcement learning different from supervised learning. So that's, that's the goal. So let's jump into the first part, uh, which is what is this guy talking about and why? And you should, be sling you should not be slinking yet. OK, so what and why? Uh, so first, uh, let's discuss what do we mean by theory. Uh, we're not going to discuss what do we mean by reinforcement learning. That would be hilarious after a full day and a half of tutorials about reinforcement learning. Um, and uh, who needs theory? And uh, how does learning theory work? So in this part, in particular, I'm going to brief you a little bit about uh, statistical learning theory, which is uh, the foundations for, for machine learning, what people do there. But again, like. Right now, I'm going to be presenting a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of uh, what's out there. So that's important to keep in mind. So just for inspiration and aspiration, uh, I thought that it's, it's good to cover some basics of classical learning theory in, in supervised learning. Um, so first, uh, what is theory? Uh, so let me ask you this question. What is theory? What do you say? So. Uh, yeah. Math. Math. <laughs> That's theory. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Maybe it's part of it. 
Is it necessary to do math to do theory? It's a tool and language. Uh, so what are the uh, important ingredients of theory? If we're saying that we're building a theory or we have a, so we have assumptions uh, and then what else? We should have some theorems, right? Uh, but more generally, if you're thinking about sciences uh, theory, uh, basically what you have is you have models and predictions that make predictions about how things work, right? Uh, so that's, that's theory. You have models and you have predictions. Uh, but at the same time, everyone was right who said that we need math. And uh, predictions about what, right? So here, we are not really studying uh, physical uh, processes. Uh, we, are not, we are not really doing science here. What we are doing is different. We are doing mathematics. We are studying uh, you know, way things are set up, things that can be computed. These are uh, conceptual things, right? These are in mind. We can instantiate them in a computer in some approximate fashion, but mostly these are just conceptual things. Uh, and not really that much uh, connected to the physical world. But at the end of the day, if you want to build a robot, then of course it's going to be connected to the physical world. So to make the theory useful, maybe you should have some connection to it. So, um, so that's the that's definition of theory for me. Uh, and uh, so my next slide is about these two gentlemen. Uh, do you, does anyone in the audience know who these gentlemen are? Any guesses? I've heard Maxwell. So that's the guy on the left. The left? The right. The right for you. Yes. And uh, the other guy? No? Marconi. Ah, cheater. Marconi, yes. Uh, so the gentleman is a big beard. Uh, this Maxwell, the other guy is Marconi. Uh, so what did these guys do? Huh? Electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is uh, basically the invention of Maxwell. What is the invention of Marconi? Radio. The radio. What? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in a way, Maxwell, you know, he came way earlier than Marconi. Uh, he invented the so called Maxwell equations that summarize how electromagnetic waves travel in space uh, in time. And with that, he created the foundation with his theory for building useful devices like the radio, right? So oftentimes, this is what happens, uh, that uh, Maxwell was not really interested in building a radio. He wanted to understand some phenomena. He wanted to build a theory for the sake of understanding something. and. Uh, and this, this is uh, often what uh, theoreticians would do. They would you know, go about their little problems uh, that may look like as toy problems, but along the way, who knows? Uh, in this case, you had to wait quite a couple of decades uh, before uh, the discovery of the Maxwell equations led to something ultimately so useful, like the radio. But, uh, but it happened. All right, so um, there are those of us who want to do theory for the sake of you know, seeking knowledge and as ultimate source of knowledge. But a lot of folks who say that ah, I don't really feel that I should be doing theory, uh, the question is, should you still care? Of course, if you are coming to this talk, what do you expect from this speaker? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Uh, so why? Why should you care? Uh, well, I say that predictions and theory in an ideal setting are going to help you to do the following things. Maybe design algorithms, design new algorithms, design better algorithms that exist today. So you could use theory for that. Uh, if you have some algorithm, you can ask questions about how does it behave? When does it function? When does it work? 
And you can try to study this in an experimental setting, and you should, and, and that's all fine. But to ultimately understand what, where are the boundaries of the, the scope of uh, an ergotum, uh, well, it's hard to imagine doing that without here. Um, or if you want more quantified uh, information about, for example, you have an uncertain situation and you want to quantify uncertainty, uh, then theory can help you to do that. Uh, lastly, uh, but not least, uh, if you want to identify new uh, challenges or refine all challenges, yes, that's, that's also theory. So, um, I'm not sure that I convinced everyone that they should care about theory, but I hope that I, I did. But if, if not, then let's look at this, right? So, we know that ship happens. Um, so why is this important? So when you are trying to tweak your neural network and running those experiments day and night, uh, and it doesn't work, how do you figure out why it doesn't work? Well, if you have a model in place that is able to describe when things are expected to work, then you can look at deviations from those idealistic situations and find out what is causing uh, your actual experiment not to run successfully. And I think that uh, without exaggeration, we can say that, uh, like in this field of us, uh, these days, uh, I think there is a very, very tiny little fraction of, uh, of experiments that lead to published uh, results, and there will be a lot of uh, sweat and work that goes into trying out things and then seeing them fail. And if you want to, like, my, my mission is to try to convince you that if you think a little bit about theory, then maybe you will have some shortcuts there to prevent some failures or to recognize the sources of the failures and then uh, prevent future failures. All right. Uh, but the truth is that theory and practice are not antagonistic at all. They are together, like yin and yang. And, uh, even in the case of Maxwell, uh, Maxwell didn't just invent the electromagnetic uh, waves and their equations uh, out of the thin air. There were lots of experimental evidence that there is something there that needs to be explained. Right? And then eventually that beautiful theory led to future things. So that's how theory and practice are working hands in hands. All right. Uh, okay. So, uh, with that, uh, I finish my, uh, you know, sermon of uh, praising theory. Uh, so let's jump into the middle of things. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about statistical learning theory, as I, I uh, promised before. Uh, so what are the ingredients of, of this theory? Uh, so there are distributions, samples, learning algorithms, predictors, and loss functions. Uh, so how many people of you are familiar with this uh, notation and, and terminology? Let's raise hands. Uh, okay, oh, that's good. Uh, nevertheless, I think that it's good to uh, have uh, some uh, recordings of, of these ideas. And, and let's do this in the context of uh, binary classification, which is the simplest uh, possible Supervised learning task. All right. So I'm going to instantiate all these things in the context of binary classification. So the distributions, uh, what are they? Uh, so there will be some input space. Uh, I usually denote that by capital X. And it could be like RD, so d-dimensional Euclidean space. And that is a, an output space. And since we're talking about binary classification, the output space is going to have two elements conveniently denoted by 0 and 1. Then we are going to have a class of distributions over the cross product of the input space and the output space. So M is my notation for all the distributions over 
that set, right? So what's in the argument of the set? That's where the samples are going to live. And so if I say P is a subset of all the distributions, if I take any element of P, that means that from that distribution, I can generate you know, samples. I can generate samples in an IID fashion. So do you guys in the back uh, see my writing or you just, OK. All right. Uh, so we can generate these samples. So a sample is a list of tuples, xi and yi, leaving this space, x cross y. And in classical learning theory, we assume that xi and yi are identically distributed according to some distribution in our family of distributions. In learning theory, in one part, it's called agnostic learning theory, you make no restriction on P. You're going to equate P, this class of distributions, with the set of all possible distributions. So there is no further restrictions. In other parts of learning theory, you start to make some restrictions. and um, the results are going to differ because of that. So anyways, back to here. Uh, so xi and yi are a random variable that are sampled from this distribution p. And we're going to assume independence between them. So when you have this situation, then we say that this xi yi sequence is an iid sequence. Independent, identi identically distributed sequence of random variables. So this is how you think about your data. So you're thinking about that. My data, Sn, was somehow born by someone throwing dice repeatedly n times. And the dice had so many different ways, so many different sizes, that I, as a result of the dice rules, I got these guys. And Xi describes my input, and Yi describes what I want to predict, given the input. Um, so the next ingredient uh, in, in learning theory is uh, predictors. So in this case, the, uh, the predictors are just maps. We also call them hypotheses from the input to the label space, so to y. So y is, uh, this y space is just uh, 0, 1. So these are functions that map inputs to uh, either 0 or 1. We're trying to predict the labels. And for what? Well, not for the data that is in our data set, but for future data. Okay. How are we going to evaluate how good is a predictor? So if you pick a predictor like H, we're going to assign a loss to it. And when we're assigning loss, we have many, many choices. The simplest possible choice to assign a loss is the following. So the loss function is going to map um, a hypothesis and an element of the x, uh, y cross product space to Generally, it, it maps to non-negative numbers. And the way it works is that you plug in the, uh, the age, and then you plug in an x and a y into the loss function. And uh, the simplest possible loss function is called a binary loss. Uh, it's defined as a loss of 1 if h of x is not equal to y, and otherwise it's a 0. Right. So we dressed up this, this abstract uh, terminology uh, with this specific case, this is binary classification. Oh, I didn't say what a learning algorithm was. A learning algorithm, uh, it's not really an algorithm, so that's a misnomer. It's a learning strategy or whatnot. It's going to map a sample to a hypothesis, right? So it maps uh, the space x cross y to the power of n space 
to uh, the space of all possible hypotheses, and all the space of all possible hypotheses in this case could be all the maps H that maps X to Y. So we don't care about how to compute this. We just say, well, the learning algorithm at the end of the day is just going to deliver a predictor. If you have a predictor and you have this distribution, then you can ask, OK, how good is this predictor? So that's the risk. So the risk of the predictor is just the expected loss of the predictor under the distribution P. So let's denote this uh, by R, H, and P, which is uh, the probability that H of X is not equal to Y in the case of binary classification where X and a Y are jointly distributed according to P. So now a learning algorithm delivers, based on the sample, which is random, a hypothesis. Hypothesis is going to be random itself. So if I plug in the output, I guess uh, I better write here. If I plug in the output of the learning algorithm, uh, which is A of Sn, into the risk function, which is going to deliver me a random number that depends on the randomness of the sample. right? And then you can say, oh, OK, so that's the risk of the hypothesis produced by the algorithm. And in general, you're interested in algorithms that produce hypotheses with low risk. The hypothesis with the lowest risk is called a base hypothesis for whatever reason. And you want to be close to that. Uh, since this is a random number, you can't just say that, well, it's 5. Well, it depends on what the input is, Sn is. It's going to have a distribution, right? So the important thing is that this is going to have a distribution. So it's, it's non-negative because we said that the losses are non-negative. It's distributed in some way. So you can characterize it by its mean, by its variance. Uh, and then when we're talking about, oh, how confident are you that the risk of your uh, of the uh, hypothesis produced by your, your learning algorithm is, is above, uh, I don't know, uh, below uh, 0 0.1, uh, we're talking about this probability mass that's there, which depends on an unknown p, which you don't know. So even the problem of knowing how well you're doing becomes kind of challenging in this framework. So you need to have tools to deal with that. So this is kind of the, the setting where we are starting from, the learning theory setting. OK. So um, how does learning theory work? Um, there are many questions asked in learning theory. One of the questions is, uh, belongs to what I call a priori analysis. How well a learning algorithm will perform on new data, on future data? That tries to answer questions about this distribution. Without seeing P, without uh, seeing Sn. It's an a priori prediction. Like if you have uh, P coming from this family and your learning algorithm is like that, this is what's going to happen. It's a priori prediction. And the posterior analysis or prediction uh, is after seeing the data, Still not knowing P, what can you conclude about the distribution of the risk? So there's a subject of a, pos a posterior analysis. Okay? So learning theory studies all these. Uh, so in a prior analysis, you have, for example, results or questions like, can we compete with the best hypothesis from a given set of hypotheses? So for example, you could restrict here the set of hypotheses uh, in some non-trivial way. And you say that, ah, I just want to compete with the best hypothesis over there without putting any restrictions on P. That's called agnostic PREC framework, uh, Wapnik's learning theory. Uh, and the problem is, uh, can we match the best possible loss, assuming 
the data generating distribution belongs to a known family. So that's what mostly people do in parametric and non-parametric statistical analysis. Other problems include, does algorithm, uh, some algorithm achieve something? All right. Um, so I'm going to sk uh, skip over this slide and uh, just uh, skip to two fundamental results of statistical learning theory, which are uh, crucially important to know about. Uh, at least know because uh, it's, it's just, you know, foundation for uh, a lot of the thinking that goes into to learning theory. Um, so I'm going to present two results, the fundamental theorem of statistical learning theory and, and the result com about computation complexity. So notice that we haven't talked about computation complexity of the algorithm yet, but there is a question, question uh, of whether you can achieve a small risk uh, in an efficient way, efficiently computable way. It's not enough to say that, yes, you can achieve a small risk because maybe it's not computable. Uh, all right, so uh, the fundamental theorem of statistical learning theory uh, answers uh, the question for problem number one. And it goes like this, it's very simple. Uh, if you take any hypothesis class, H, which is a subset of this, this big hypothesis class, there is a unique number, it's called the VC dimension of H, and I'm not going to define it. Uh, most likely you have heard about it anyways. Uh, that characterizes this class, and if you want to compete uh, with the loss of a best hypothesis up to an accuracy of epsilon, so your access risk shouldn't be more than uh, epsilon of the best possible risk over the hypothesis space H, then you are going to need at least uh, the VC dimension of H divided by epsilon square samples, and it's possible to, uh, to achieve this risk with this many samples. So this, up to log factors, this is tight. So this is the inherent difficulty of competing with the best hypothesis in a, a hypothesis class in this statistical learning theory setting. So that's, that's one of the foundation results. It's cool, eh? <laughs> um, I think it's cool. Uh, it's, it's a pure information theory result. And the algorithm that achieves this is super simple. It's called X, uh, empirical risk minimization. It's basically, ah, uh, compute the empirical loss and uh, assume that you can minimize it over the hypothesis space of your choice. And you can prove that this is this, is, this algorithm, algorithm, it's not, it's like arc min algorithm, is um, going to achieve this, this guarantee. Uh, at the same time, Things are not rosy, uh, not that rosy uh, altogether. So the next result concerns the computation complexity of dealing with some very simple hypothesis spaces. So in linear classification. In linear classification, the input space has uh, a vector space uh, structure. It's like RD. Let's say it's RD. And um, And the hypothesis space is, uh, you know, on one side of a linear hyperplane, uh, you have a plus one, the other side you have a zero label. Okay, so very, very simple hypothesis. And you're trying to compete with the best uh, hyperplane. And this result says that, unfortunately, in this framework, when you have no idea about the underlying distribution, no restrictions on the underlying distribution. This seems to be computationally hard. The exact result says that unless uh, NP is equal to RP, uh, RP is this uh, class which is maybe a little bit bigger than P. Uh, it's randomized time polynomial. Uh, so unless um, NP uh, equals RP, which most of the people don't believe it's true, uh, linear classifiers cannot be learned in polynomial time in this framework. Yes? Do you have an idea of how different non-linear classifiers are from It will be harder. <laughs> right? So if linear is this hard, then non-linear could be much harder. Hmm? 
Why would it be easier? Okay, so if, if it's a subset, right? I don't know. Uh, actually, people study these questions on a case-by-case -case basis. Unfortunately, we don't really have a generic good understanding of the computation complexity of this task. But I don't think that we should have high hopes about that suddenly uh, because uh, you're considering nonlinear classes, it's going to be easier. But at the same time, there are some interesting phenomena. Sometimes, for example, if you allow yourself a little bit of lag, uh, like a bigger class sometimes actually could have. Uh, if you're choosing a bigger class of functions, then there are two things that are happening. The smallest risk becomes smaller, so it might be harder to get to there, to that point. But at the same time, maybe somehow the search space is uh, changed in some miraculous fashion. But uh, in general, uh, we know that uh, like we have harness results for training neural networks, if, if you're really interested in that. Like I can talk offline about that. Uh, and also about whether those results are relevant or not, because that's, that's also a question, right? So these hardness results always use, it's a worst case thing. They, they make up something. Right. Um, so I think this is also cool. Uh, why is it cool? It's a negative result. Shouldn't we be said? <laughs> in a way, yeah, you can be sad about it, but it's a fact. You have to live with it. It's cool to know a fact, right? And you know that, well, if, if this is how things are here, then maybe we have to change something if we want to deal with real stuff. Um, so I think that uh, negative results are, are absolutely fantastic. And that's like the unique contribution of theory uh, to, to machine learning. It's, uh, there is nothing better than that. Uh, it's kind of like you're trying to, to know what's possible and what's not possible. And you're trying to push the boundaries from inside and from outside, both ways. You want to figure out where, where, where is the thing that is possible to do. All right. Right. Polynomial time, yes. But so here you need to reach an uh, epsilon regret. You would need right. The computation time cannot be polynomial, because then you would be solving some hard com uh, combinatorial problems. So there is a reduction from a combinatorial problem to uh, minimizing risk up to an epsilon accuracy. If you could do that in time, which is polynomial, uh, in uh, what? In 1 over epsilon, the VC dimension of H, so you can't enumerate all the hypotheses, and, and basically this, then you can't do it. Okay. So for example, 1 over epsilon to the n is not polynomial. 1 over epsilon to the n is not polynomial, yeah. So you can do things like that. It just takes too much time. And is the number of samples. Yeah. OK, other questions? All right, I'm doing very badly this time. Uh, OK, let's skip. Um, so batch learning, uh, finally getting to reinforcement learning. Uh, so batch learning was mentioned already in uh, Joel's tutorial. Uh, it is this problem where someone was collecting data for you, and you try to learn a policy based on the data. OK, so I'm going to put this uh, into a framework that is the closest to the supervised learning framework. So how does it work? Uh, the way it works is that you have this uh, xt, at, yt, rt tuple. So this is a state that is sampled from this distribution mu. This is an action that's sampled from some policy of your choice. It's like a Markovian policy, so it can be stochastic or it could be deterministic. So given a state, gives you an action, maybe randomly. And then there is a next state that is sampled from the property kernel that describes the MDP underlying. So I'm using an MDP framework here. Um, so yt is the next state. 
And for simplicity and to avoid further complications, it's the nicest case. We're going to assume that the data is IID. OK? Yes? I'm uh, confused about where A comes from. So you're, you're uh, specifying that there's one fixed policy pi that generated all of this data? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just imagining a very simple scenario where someone is running a policy to generate data. So if you have observational studies, for example, this is kind of what's going on, right? Like someone uh, is generating the data, they are running their processes. Uh, you may or may not know the data generating policy, but you are recording everything. Basically, you are recording that, well, there was this state, and then there was this action, there was the next state. By the way, uh, states are evil, but let's move on. Uh, <laughs> For simplicity, let's assume that you have access to states. I mean, like, it's, it's like an impossible thing. Like, you don't have access to states. But like, for simplicity, and like, you will see where I'm going with this. And then you will say that, yeah, it was fine. Uh, but I always want to scream when someone says states. Um, uh, I do say states often. Yes? Uh, but there are states that are not consecutive for each other. This is not a trace. Yeah, it's not a trace. We, we can talk about traces later, but it's, it's like there is a distribution. It's like the supervised learning setting, right? Like it's just, but we have these little, little transitions, right? So someone samples an initial state, and then this is one transition that is made, and you record a transition. So you learn about the dynamics, but it's little pieces of the dynamics that you, you can learn about. And you learn about the reward as well. So you, you see the reward. And you have a fixed horizon H, OK? So I want to simplify things, no discounting. It's just fixed horizon, OK? And you have a class of policies. And since I want to mimic what people do in supervised learning, I just want to find uh, an epsilon optimal policy in this policy class pi. And I'm asking the question, OK, what is, give me a sample complexity result for this problem, right? It's so like in supervised learning, if you have your data generated from some unknown distribution P, the only thing that matters is the VC dimension of the class. So in this case, the class is the policy class. We want to compete with the best policy in this class, given the distribution that we don't know, this uh, probability kernel and the reward. And can we do it? It's a very simple question. We should start there. Good? All right. So let's see how it goes. Uh, so recall uh, that, uh, that the value of a policy is what? Uh, like, basically, you have to sum up the rewards and take expectations, right? Like, if you let the policy roll and you go for uh, H steps, so in this case, you go for H steps, and, and you take the expectation. So for any, any state, you're going to have uh, some value. Here, I'm going to assume that you are initial state is sampled from this distribution mu for simplicity. Uh, and I just want the policy that when the initial state is sampled from mu gives you the maximum reward, expected reward, after eight steps. And I'm fine with an epsilon to my policy too. OK. So one easy corollary, if you take the horizon to be 0, so there is no trajectories. This is just supervised learning. Right? You just want to maximize immediate reward. Right? Just one step. You don't care about dynamics, prediction, future, whatnot. Just immediate reward maximization. This is kind of like one particular case of supervised learning. It's called cost-sensitive classification. It's like not really the binary classification, but it's pretty close. And you can imagine how you can get sample complexity results in this case as well. And they will be very similar to the sample complexity result that we had. Fine. So let's move on to something more challenging. Uh, all right, so OK, just spelling out the obvious. Uh, let's take the case, and the horizon is 2. So you're basically going to make two steps. And I'm going to consider a very simple policy space and a very simple example that is going to prove this, uh, this first result. So the state space is going to be 0, 1. And the policies 
are like this. You choose a threshold, and on the right of the threshold, you take action one, and on the left of the threshold, you choose action minus. So you can adjust the threshold. That's your parameter. That's theta. That's a policy class. And now take the following MDP. Uh, if you start at state zero, you stay at state zero. If you start at state one, you stay at state one. If you start anywhere but 0 0.5, 0, and 1, you transition in a single step to 0 0.5. Okay? And if you're at 0 0.5, if you take plus 1, you get to 1. If you take the action minus 1, you get to 0. Is this clear? Very, very simple. So let mu, this distribution, be the uniform distribution of the, on 0, 1. And let's imagine that we generate this data that we have from the uniform distribution. We collect n samples. And then we need to learn what to do. The catch is that there are two MDPs. I'm saying and there are not more than two MDPs. In one of the MDPs, if you get to, zero, uh, if you get to uh, state 0, you're going to get a plus 1 reward there and a minus 1 reward at uh, 1. And in the other MDP, it's the other way around. The good state is 1, and the bad state is 0. OK? And uh, you're generating and generating and generating the samples. Well, first of all, you're not going to hit 0 or 1. So you will never see whether you're going to get the reward of 0 or 1. And you will also not hit uh, 0 0.5 ever in the sample. There's a probability of 0. So you can generate infinitely many samples. And you're not going to learn to distinguish these two MDPs. And in one of the MDPs, you should be going left. In the other MDP, you should be going right. And the policies uh, have a very simple structure as well. So there is no counterpart of the fundamental theorem of statistical learning theory in batch reinforcement learning. Just not possible. Right? So in this generality, sorry, you can't say much. This was just meant as a very simple example illustrating how things very quickly escalate in, in reinforcement learning. And uh, again, you have a negative result. What do you do? Go home, close shop, one. Uh, well, we should think about what the problem is. What, what's causing this? Uh, how are we going to reconcile this with all the good experiences that we have with reinforcement learning? Well, first of all, what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, the critical decision is at 0 0.5. But in the data, 0 0.5 doesn't appear ever. Or 0 and 1 doesn't appear ever, right? Uh, so can we make it so that like, we are sure that all the critical states similar to 0 0.5 uh, and 0 and 1 appear in the data well, without any further, I mean, like, uh, it is a very strange assumption to, to make that, uh, that it's sure that this is happening. Nevertheless, uh, people try. So we can, we can try to, to make assumptions like we're going to have better sampling distributions. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of like really hard to push this through. OK, any questions? Was the example clear? Mu uh, is the distribution uh, that you're generating the initial states from. 
So you turn anything in initial states from the uniform distribution. And then you follow the transition kernel for one step. So if you happen to be, you know, like, you're going to be somewhere here. So all that you're going to see is that all the transitions go to 0 0.5. That's all what you have in the data. There is nothing else in the data. So you will never learn about the effect of the actions at 0 0.5, and you will never learn about the, uh, uh, the rewards at 0 and 1. Right, so that would be a good suggestion. So why not uh, consider at least two steps? I can tweak things in such a way that that doesn't help. So you could uh, draw a little tree, and then you're embedding the intermediate states uh, in such a way that you're not, never going to hit those, and, uh, and those would be key uh, to have. Right. Why not? Because you are generating the data uniformly at random. But, but then you're going to go to 0.5, and then you're going to. You only that. see it as a next state. You don't see it as a starting state. But like if you, uh, so the, the dynamics of the environment. You're not following the transitions. You're only following the transitions for one step. Oh, why? It's because that's how I set it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you're following transitions for multiple steps, yeah. uh, then the, the problem is a little bit more delicate, but it has the same uh, nature. The problem is that the optimal policy might want to you know, uh, go a certain way. And all the data that you are seeing from the policy that you, you were using to generate the data goes some other way. And if you're not seeing these keyhole states, which are really important for you know to how to act, then the situation is doomed. I think this is very important to understand, because this is one of the challenges that we face all the time in reinforcement learning, that we are learning with changing distributions as opposed to uh, in supervised learning, where the train and the test distributions are mostly the same, right? So when I said that let's compute the risk of the hypothesis, it was this under the same distribution that was used to generate the data. It was not a different distribution. In reinforcement learning, when you switch to a policy, you switch to a new distribution. There is no control over that. That's much harsher. It's a harder learning problem because of this. It's inherently harder. OK, one more question, and then we need to move on. It seems like the problem comes from the fact that you sampled your data from the uniform distribution. Ah, uh, no. I mean, like, you, you pick a distribution, I pick a problem. We can play this game, right? <laughs> and then it won't work. Like, you can always imagine that I can trick you by choosing a specific MDP, because we didn't put any restriction on any MDP. So I'm going to, like, be very tricky with that. Anyways, uh, so let's move on. Uh, we can talk offline uh, later on. So what? Uh, so is this the end of the world? Well, no, I mean, like, you can push it. I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it later. Uh, but we, have, we do have some general recipes for positive results as well. So people are pushing the algorithms. And you can do an inverse analysis. You look at the algorithm and you say that, hey, under what conditions can I prove that this algorithm does work? And then you can work with the conditions. And that's helpful for debugging things when things don't work. So it's not going to be a general theory like the fundamental uh, theory of learning, uh, theorem of learning theory. But you can still analyze specific algorithms. And I will show uh, uh, the result of such analysis later. Um, OK. So the next topic I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about is when you have a simulator. Because this kind of addresses this, uh, this issue that we're discovering that uh, distributions mismatch exist in reinforcement learning. It's inherent to reinforcement learning. 
the training distribution in, in the batch setting and the distribution in use by the policies are just different, and that's a problem. But if you have a simulator, it's a whole different new world. You can simulate trajectories as you will. You can generate new data under your, uh, your policy. So this leads to what we call a planning problem. Uh, and so in a planning problem, uh, the way I define it, you imagine that you have a huge MDP. It's so big that you can't hope to enumerate all the states in it. In fact, you will have a problem naming the states in the MDP. And your goal is to compute still maybe a good policy within a restricted policy class or overall uh, an action of a good policy. Um, so, um, right. Uh, so which one is easier? Uh, so that, that's a very good question. Uh, is it easier to compute a good action uh, at a given initial state, or is it easier to come up with a, a good policy from, let's say, uh, same policy class? Well, gut feeling should be that it should be easier to get a good action, because if you have a good policy, then you just take the action that it recommends. Uh, so the second problem is definitely not harder, but it's actually easier. It's a good question. Uh, there are cases when it's actually easier. So that's one general lesson. I'm not going to talk about the details of that, but just keep that in mind that if you don't have to solve some problem, like getting a globally optimal policy that's optimal everywhere, because you only care about this state, then you can focus your computational resources on that state and do more and be better at that state. And then when the next state comes along, you do some more computation. Right? You can spread out the computation in time that way. And it's, there is a separation between these two results in the sense that the first problem is strictly harder than the second one. OK. Um, an important thing here is that there is no information theoretic ignorance. It's like you are going to assume that you have access to infinitely many samples of the model. So it's not like an information theory problem, but it's more like a computation problem that we are trying to address here. Uh, so working with large MDPs has its own challenges. Uh, and there are different access models that people use. One is to uh, access transition probabilities and rewards for any uh, triple transition. Uh, the other is the simulator model, where, where you assume that there, there is a simulator at hand, and you can simulate the outcome of taking action at some state. Do it states. But if you had a starting state, fine. And then maybe along the way you were generating other states. If you think about the Atari games or whatnot, like, can you just like start a game from any state? Like, uh, even naming the states becomes a little bit difficult. So maybe you could uh, hack the Atari games, but uh, many times the simulators are not such that you can just generate a state like that. Like maybe you can sample states from some initial distribution. Uh, so this is how you can deal with a, a large MDP where you can't just describe everything that you know about the MDP. I mean, like maybe you have equations, but uh, that's uh, not really the same thing as describing all individual transition probabilities. Okay, uh, so here is a, a little algorithm uh, just to whet your appetite. It's called uh, fitted value iteration, and uh, the version of it that uses actual values is the basis of DQM. Right? Like, so how about trying to understand what this algorithm does? Uh, so how does this work? So the algorithm works as follows. We all know value iteration, right? So you just have the Bamon operator. You keep applying the Bamon operator. And eventually, what you get is the optimal value function, and you are greedy after that with respect to the value function that you, you got. So this is what we're trying to mimic, but we only have a simulator. So we're going to simulate the effect of the Bamon operator. So how do we do that? Uh, so the iterations. Uh, of value iteration are, are in this loop where k goes from 1 to k. So capital K iterations of value iterations are simulated here. And the way it goes is that we are um, going to solve a regression problem where we are setting up some targets for the regression problem. 
And we are trying to regress using a function space to fit at certain states uh, the target values. What are the target values? Well, it's the target value is what the Bamon operator should give if uh, we use the current value function, which is v, and we uh, update, we uh, applied it uh, at state x. So the Bamon operator basically computes uh, expected reward plus expected value of next state. And if you have a simulator, you can just simulate many transitions and take an average instead of taking expectations. So that's what this very simple algorithm does. Okay. Uh, so you set up the disregression problem, and then uh, there you go. So picture the way it works is that you have the space f, which is the space of functions that you can represent with your regression architecture. Maybe it's a neural network. And you would apply the BAM on operator, but it doesn't quite work. So you need to project it back to the, the function space. And you do that in a noisy fashion. right? So this is going to be a noisy uh, version. And then uh, you project back. And then noisy and project back. And then you hope that you're making progress. It's a very simple idea, how to use a simulator to, uh, to uh, emulate value iteration. Does it work? Well, uh, let's start with the bad news. Uh, so if you make up an algorithm like this, fitted value iteration, and you're iterating and iterating and iterating, you hope that it's going to do something useful, convert or whatnot. Well, bad news is that often it doesn't. So I won't have time to explain the details of this very simple example, but uh, in this simple example, you assume uh, that you generate actually infinitely many samples. So the only uh, approximation that's going on is that you are projecting to a function space. And so you have this uh, take a step with the Bamon operator, apply a projection. Take a step with the Bamon operator, apply a projection. So you don't suffer from the noise that's coming from the Monte Carlo simulation. And yet, what you're going to find is that this nice idea just completely blows up. Right? So in a very simple setting, uh, um, you compute how the iterations are updating some parameter in a, in a linear setting, which just blows up. So uh, that's one thing. Watch out for instability in reinforcement learning. Uh, so is it really just a theoretical thing? Well, since for a long time we know that this is not just a theoretical thing. So uh, there's plenty of experimental evidence that shows that uh, this disaster really, really exists uh, in reinforcement learning from this old paper of uh, Justin Boyan and Moore. Uh, uh, this is an example where you're in a grid word, and you're trying to get to some corner, and you use a, um, linear basis functions. It's a quadratic approximation. It's like three parameters or whatnot. And you apply this fitted value iteration, and what you say is that instead of the agent is not learning to get to the corner it was supposed to get, but it's learning to get to the opposite corner. How beautiful is that? So it doesn't blow up, but it, it's doing something very really interesting. OK, so another example with neural networks uh, from the same paper. So as a result of this, uh, you could see uh, around the 90s and later on things like this in the papers. Uh, so Justin Boyan and Andrew Moore writes, in light of these experiments, we conclude that the straightforward combination of DP and function approximation is not robust. So DeepMind should be closed down. <laughs> All right. Um, and Jeffrey Gordon, uh, same way. Uh, I mean, it's, these are really worrisome. It's, it's truly worrisome. Like, you have very simple examples where things don't work, right? Like, maybe we should have better algorithms then. You can push a little bit harder. Oh, sorry. What happened to my beautiful equations? Uh, yeah. It's super complicated. Uh, right. Only pictures. Uh, no equations from this point on. 
it seems. Uh, anyways, so this is really surprising. You know what? Because it's, it's a picture I copied. So it's impossible. <laughs> but the impossible happens. Anyways, um, going back to the talk, it was just Move it around. <laughs> yeah. Rotate it. <laughs> it's much better, eh? Um, right. So if you want to know the details of this, you definitely have to talk to me. Uh, all right. So the point of this was that, OK, there is this fitted value iteration ergotum. It's not that like it never works. It works sometimes. So why not try to understand under what conditions does it work and derive a bond on how good a policy you can get after k iterations. And uh, with joint work with Remy Munoz, we did this, and then this is not the result of it. Uh, but the bond has important terms that explain what is important to make this ergotum work. And the few things that are important to make this ergotum work are the following. So first of all, you have to have a very flexible approximation architecture. That means that like, whatever value function the Bamon operator is going to throw at you, you should be able to approximate it if you are starting from a value function that was in your function space. Or approximate it pretty well. So one of the terms that's hard to see there, so this is the error. <laughs> and one of the terms that you see there is this. Uh, so that captures this approximation error. What? The mouse is not pointing on the screen. The mouse is not, OK. All right, OK. What can you do? Um, it's getting worse and worse. Now? Wow. Hey. All right. Um, all right. So, so that's one of the terms. Uh, another term that you don't see describes the affinity of the sampling distribution and the distributions that the policies induce. As you're learning, you're implicitly inducing some policies, which are the greedy policies susceptible value functions that you, you came up with. And those induce some distributions. So the uh, divergence between these two are going to be in a bound. So if these two things are controlled, basically you are in control. Right. So why is this important? It's important because you can do very well if you're controlling these things. And that's what DQN is doing. Right? Uh, so what is difference uh, compared to uh, what was happening before? Uh, so what happened is that mu was not fixed in DQN, but it was slowly changing. It's called experience replay to make better the distributions and the policies that you come up with. Right? We have this divergence term in a bond. I can predict that if you need to keep the divergence term small, if you want to have a stable ergotone, that's going to deliver good performance. The other thing that's important is that you have a very flexible architecture. It's a convolution of neural networks with many, many neurons in it. And uh, it has the right biases as well, um, meaning that well, you have to work with these images in this setting, uh, the other games. And uh, because of that, you don't need that many uh, examples. Um, and uh, right, so these are, these are key. And uh, I say that theory kind of predicts it. Uh, of course, uh, it. It would be very, very good to see some data published on the relative importance of these individual tricks. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll see some of those. Yes? So what was the term that is representing the flexibility of the approximation? The DTFF? Uh, it's like the worst case approximation error if you're taking one value function in F and you apply the BAM on operator to it, and you try to approximate the resulting function with a function from your function space. 
it's an LP mu error because we, we choose the LP mu uh, norm to, to measure the errors. But it's worst case overdose. Uh, and then many people actually criticize the result that it's, it's worst case, like it's, it, it demands that uh, this worst case error should be small, but I think it's really important. If the worst case error is not small, you are likely to run into trouble. And then what we see is that you have these oversized architectures right now, right? Driving down the, this worst case approximation error. And then plus you're, uh, you know, dealing with this coverage shift, these two, uh, two problems, and then you can have better performance. Uh, all right, so if you push harder, it works. It's good. Uh, so here is my little map of planning methods. So these are the things I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about this, this forward planning, which is local planning or the hybrids or actor critique or policy search. Peter was talking about this, uh, actually all these. And uh, I was just mostly just talking about this, but there are very many uh, interesting designs, but let me, let me just skip to the next part. So, uh, Right, so in the last part, I want to talk about a case when you don't have a simulator, but you have access to the real world. So no simulator, no pain, well, things are getting real. Look at that. <laughs> right, uh, so this is what we call online learning. Uh, online learning is an abused and overused term in learning theory. Uh, and when I'm talking about online learning, I'm talking about a system that's learning to achieve some goal by interacting with a real system. And uh, when I'm talking about online learning, I, I tend to focus on the goal of collecting lots of lots of rewards as you're learning. So during learning, you can't afford to lose much reward. You die. So the performance metric is simply just the total reward collected, or in many cases in the literature, you will see this flipped around metric, which is like the access, uh, like the missing reward, which is the regret, which is like if I used a good policy from the beginning on, uh, I would have collected this much reward. Compared to that, I've collected this much, which is less, and so the gap between the two is my regret. So people are kind of like flipping things around for whatever historical reasons. It's kind of like a normalization thing. Uh, it's like the access risk. You're talking about the access risk of uh, a hypothesis over the best hypothesis in the class. Here you're talking about the reward that you have lost. That's the regret. So you want the regret to be small. You want the regret uh, small and reward maximized. I'm not going to talk about this framework uh, that's called PACMDP. Uh, no time for that. So why should we care about this? Uh, well, before we jump into believing that we should care about this, uh, let's investigate what, what is the alternative. Uh, uh, one alternative would be just to build a simulator. Eh? Uh, so use your samples, build a model, and you use planning, like in previous parts. Uh, the problem is that uh, sometimes the models are very, very challenging to build. Uh, so right now I'm working on, on some applied project where you have to deal with fluid dynamics. It's nasty. Uh, and if you have some unmodeled dynamics, then they, the unmodeled dynamics might have unpredictable uh, effect on uh, the performance of your policy. So you might find the best policy for your simulator, but maybe when you deploy it on a real system, it's not going to do any good for you. So that's a, that's a problem. And uh, so sometimes uh, this model-based area just doesn't work, uh, or it's too complicated. And then sometimes online learning can actually be uh, done in an effective way, you know, like on the internet. You can scale up things. Uh, and, uh, and that's the opportunity. Uh, caveat, 
so these are not antagonistic. Model-based uh, RL and online learning, I mean, like an online learning algorithm can totally use a model-based uh, algorithm underneath. So what is the challenge here? Uh, so I want mainly focus on why is this problem hard? So recall that what we are trying to do is that we're trying to explore an unknown environment to collect as much reward as possible. So consider this simple setting where you are in a river and you can swim upstream to get to the big bounty. And if you're just like lazily splashing around, then you're going to reach the humble pie. Okay? So you can model this as an MDP with so many states, n states, where you have the red action, which is like when you're sweating in the water and splashing and trying to make progress, but mostly with probability one half, you are staying in place, and with probability one half, you're making progress towards your intended direction. And if you're not doing anything, then you're just going downstream. So you have two actions. Okay. And uh, so in this case, I told you that this is, uh, this is where the, uh, uh, the big bounty is, but maybe there are forks in the river and whatnot, and so there is a real exploration aspect to the question of where to go. Okay. And uh, the challenge is the following. So uh, if you apply an, a learning algorithm or whatnot, uh, and you find, uh, you know, like you, you make it, you make it uh, work to some extent, then the learning algorithm very quickly is going to discover the humble pie. And it's going to say that, yeah, it's better than in the water, so a good policy is to get to the humble pie, right? And then maybe, you know, like following uh, common advice, you're going to add epsilon exploration. So that means that with certain probability, you're going to deviate from your intended action, which is to go towards the hammer pie. So if you do this, imagine how long it's going to take for you to discover that there is this big bounty waiting for you. So this, this is shown here. Uh, of course, the time required as the number of state grows to reach uh, from this state to this state is exponential. If you're doing this random exploration, randomly choosing between the two actions. So a pretty big, big epsilon. Epsilon is 0 0.5. Okay, so we're running epsilon greedy after we discover that it's good to go to Humber Pi. With 0 0.5, huge exploration. It takes exponential time on the average to get to the big pie. Whereas if you have an algorithm which is saying that, well, I haven't seen this state, I haven't seen it, let's go there, let's, let's see the states that we haven't seen yet, okay? Then it takes linear time. So it's exponentially less time to get uh, to the big bounty. So the important thing is that there is an exponential gap between uh, the behavior of these two things. Uh, right. So this shows, I hope, in a convincing fashion that very simple exploration schemes like epsilon greedy are not going to make it, oftentimes. Something, they could. Right? Like maybe the environment can be nice, and then it really doesn't really matter that much how you're exploring. But if you have a more challenging environment, Montezuma's Revenge, for example, well-known example from other games, uh, then the difference between a clever exploration and, and a not-so-clever exploration could be very, very humongous. Right. Uh, so just to give you a taste of what people do in exploration. I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, bandit problems and then how you generalize everything from bandits. Uh, so by the way, uh, you might have seen this. Uh, this is, this is my, my plug for this website that we wrote together with Tol Latimor, banditax.com. So if you want to learn about bandits and exploration, that's your go-to place. Uh, Right, so what are bandits? It's our problems without the state, or with a single state. So simple. It's like, you take an action, you get to the next state, yeah, it's the same state as you have been before. <laughs> it's very simple. 
So you don't need to worry about the dynamics. But it still captures some aspect of the exploration problem. Why? Because if you take an action, you see the reward of the action, but you don't see the reward of the other actions. So you have to kind of worry about like, I need to take actions that I'm still uncertain about. How often should we do that? Uh, what frequency? So that's the question of exploration versus exploitation. So some more terminology, contextual bandits, so that's other, other problems with the next state is chosen at random independently of the action chosen, linear bandits, that's like when you assume that uh, you have a contextual bandit and the reward function itself is linear in some features of state action pairs. Uh, so key results on stochastic bandits. Uh, so here's a graph that kind of shows uh, one of the take home messages that we learned from the bandit literature. Simple strategies, even for the simple bandit case, like Epsilon, Greedy, Boltzmann, Gibbs, Explore, uh, then Commit, they fail to adapt to the difficulty of the problem. So you have a range of problems that's on the x axis. And uh, these are different instances of uh, some algorithm which is similar to uh, epsilon greedy with different values of epsilon. So different amount of exploration. And as you have more and less, more or fewer exploration, so this shows the expected regret after so many time steps. Uh, you can see that well, sometimes they are doing pretty well, so small values are good, but sometimes they are doing pretty horribly. And then you can see this algorithm called UCB, which is doing cross the board pretty well uh, compared to all of these other algorithms. So we say that this, this UCB successfully adapts to the instance that it needs to solve. So if you want an adaptive algorithm, then yes, there are those adaptive algorithms that are cleverly reasoning about uh, uncertainty, and one of them is, is UCB. So unfortunately, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna... Uh, just keep the slide about UCB. If you are interested in these algorithms, go to the website or talk to me. I'm, I'm around, very happy to talk to you about it. Uh, important things, uh, two results that say that uh, UCB is essentially optimal. Uh, so there are two types of results. Instance-dependent results uh, are dependent on the distribution uh, that generates the data. So in this case, uh, delta is going to be a data or distribution dependent constant. Uh, there is a corresponding lower bound that says that this factor cannot be reduced up to constant factors. Uh, another result says that in the worst case sense, UCB is as good as it gets. Uh, no algorithm can do uh, significantly better. Uh, right, so this just summarizes. Uh, so how about MDPs? Uh, so what does this mean for MDPs? Uh, you can actually generalize these algorithms to MDPs, and people have done it. Uh, this is from the paper of uh, Yaksh, Ortner, and Auer. Um, if you have a finite state action MDP, S is the number of states, A is the number of actions, rewards are in 0, 1, then there is an algorithm that achieves a regret for all the MDPs of this size, D is so-called diameter of the MDP. So the diameter is the maximum of the best travel times between pairs of states. So for example, for the reverse film problem, it was the number of states. And uh, so this is the upper bound, D times S times uh, square root AT. And the lower bound says that, well, as far as the dependence on the, the time, the horizon uh, is concerned, the result is optimal. As far as uh, dependence on number of actions uh, concerned, it's optimal. As far as dependence on the other quantities concerned, it's not optimal. So why is this important? So this seems like a silly result. I mean, it's a finite MDP for heaven's sake. Like, who cares about finite MDPs where you have a few number of states, few number of actions? It kind of shows that important things already, right? It shows that uh, for example, the diameter, the travel times between the states, that's going to show up in your bond. You can expect the problem to be higher if it's more difficult to get around. And more importantly, you can expect from this result, you can expect that you're not going to scale very badly with the diameter. It's not exponential scaling with the diameter. It's just, you know, linear scaling or maybe square root scaling with the diameter. 
Um, number of states shows up. Uh, that's a little bit worrisome because we like to entertain the possibility of dealing with uh, MDPs with gazillion number of states, right? Uh, well, if you don't assume any further structure, the worst case result, this lower bound tells you that you're out of luck, right? So it just tells you that, ah, hey, that's the boundary. Like this result is important. It says that you need to assume that, okay, okay, I'm done. Uh, you need to, you, didn't, you, you, you have to start to make assumptions. And there you better be reasonable, right? All right. OK. Uh, so we have a bunch of uh, other principled ways of exploring, but I'm kind of running out of time. And, uh, and we have algorithms that are building upon these ideas uh, from, uh, amongst other, from DeepMind colleagues that, in practice, uh, are building algorithms that make a huge difference. Uh, compared to uh, doing exploration in a, in a silly fashion. All right, uh, conclusions. Uh, so we started to define theory, uh, and my basic tenet is that theory and practice uh, can work very well together. Uh, another important take home message is that RL is just not supervised learning. We have all these special deals that we have to uh, worry about. Uh, there is information or distribution mismatch. Computationally, our problems tend to be uh, way more challenging, although we saw that already in supervised learning there could be some computational challenges. Uh, we talked about various uh, problem classes, batch simulation and online. And we haven't touched a lot of things. Uh, so for example, mixing. Uh, I never talked about that you don't have IID samples, like in the real world. Like you follow a trajectory and there is mixing going on or not, and how to deal with that. Even predicting how well you're doing is going to be like an, putting an error bar. This is what I mean, like predicting is not just a number that you put there. Remember, I, I drew this distribution at the beginning. This, this is a random quantity. Like all these things are random. You want to know about the distribution. You need the error bar. Who's going to put that error bar? Can you just like use the usual error bars? Well, imagine the mixing process, which is not mixing, which is repeating, repeating, repeating the same thing. You shouldn't be using the same error bars, right? So it's, it's very nuanced and challenging. OK, so uh, finally. Uh, Love negative results, um, OK. And finally, uh, bashing a little bit my field. So there exists such a thing as bad theory. Like, it could be things could go bad in two ways. One is that proofs are wrong. We shouldn't have that. Uh, but the other thing is that we could get the modeling assumptions wrong, which means that they don't quite fit reality. And there's always going to be really, really challenging. That's the most challenging part of working in this field of coming up with the right set of assumptions, right set of modeling assumptions. Uh, but we should be attentive to this. We should be conscious about this. And we can make it better. All right. I think that my time is totally up. And everyone uh, really wants to get some coffee. Uh, I'm going to hang around, so if you have any questions, uh, just any time. <laughs>